Uh, so, uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, this talk. Of course, uh, we as a career development working group uh, holding this webinar uh, in, in uh, collaboration with the communication working group of MCA. And we have uh, two very distinguished speakers today. They'll be speaking uh, about uh, uh, ongoing topics, which has already been circulated. I'll also discuss about the topics and also brief bio before they go into their talk. So it is good to know about uh, a speaker a little bit. So first talk uh, will be uh, given by uh, Dr. Antonio. And uh, 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 though he has a long CV, but uh, I will uh, read out uh, a few. Dr. Antonio uh, uh, is a researcher at uh, MODIS, Motivational Digital uh, System. Research Unit of uh, Bruno Kester Foundation, FPK, in uh, Toronto. His main research interests include models and tools for adaptive, uh, basically collective systems, and modeling uh, and development language for motivational systems based on uh, gamifications. He has been actively involved in several national and uh, European R&D projects in the field of adaptive system, intelligent mobility, and education. He is currently a member of the Erasmus Plus project in CORE, and he, he is also a senior member of IEEE, which is one of the prestigious publication uh, house, and, uh, uh, and uh, the Italian chapter of IEEE Intelligent Transportation System Society. He is also an associate editor of the International Journal of IEEE Transition on Intelligence Transportation System. Uh, uh, basically, the short form is a TITS and also the international magazines, IEEE, Technology and Society. He has been accorded a lot of uh, various national and international awards, which uh, of course I'm not going to uh, pronounce it here. He has a lot uh, more uh, you know, recognition, which cannot be done in uh, two minutes and three minutes. So with those uh, words, I request uh, Antonio to start sharing his presentation and uh, you're most welcome. Now podium is yours. So uh, thanks a lot for this nice introduction. So do you see my slide on my screen? Yeah, it is visible. It's clearly visible and it's in the full screen. Please go ahead. Okay, great. So thanks a lot for, for this invitation. It's, uh, it's my pleasure to, uh, to present to you my last research results on the field of education. And this is why today I want to introduce the research field uh, on personalized and gamified learning. So I am a senior researcher at FBK in Trento in Italy. Uh, so just a little bit about my career. So why I'm here. So I, I was a master degree student in the University of L'Aquila in Italy. Uh, and I did uh, a little bit of evolution in the research field starting from uh, working in companies in Siemens networks, uh, moving uh, in Pisa for a research grant, uh, and they took my PhD in, in Luca in 2008. So, and I did my Marie Curie uh, experience in Lisbon at the Nokia Siemens networks. Um, and after that, I moved in Trento when I started research in, in FBK and where I'm doing research today on uh, adaptive socio-technical uh, socio -technical systems. Uh, so my research direction in the last, uh, especially my, in, in my research career, cover uh, aspect of software engineering for uh, uh, AI-based systems. So I applied uh, this research in different application domains, starting from uh, adaptive by design service-based application, moving on uh, more collective adaptive system where multiple agents uh, uh, collaborate to to achieve uh, a common uh, a common goal applied in different uh, domains like mobility uh, like uh, um, uh, surveillance of cities uh, smart cities and so on and in the last five six years i uh, moved my research my adaptation research on what we call motivational digital system where we need to motivate uh, citizens uh, to, to change their behavior in order to reach a common good, uh, a specific, uh, for example, societal challenge uh, like uh, reduction of CO2 emission or also educational, uh, educational objectives in the education domain where I'm involved in, this, uh, in, the last, uh, in the last years. So in this talk, uh, um, I will introduce you what I'm doing in education. 
starting from the challenge that uh, uh, we have in this research. Uh, so in general, uh, um, uh, what we claim is that we need a change uh, in, in the educational uh, uh, sector. So we need to switch from the de delivery of notions to a more flexible and proactive approach uh, that will leverage an automation in how to use uh, AI in this kind of a new paradigm, you know. So because the education doesn't stop in the class, so we know that the students and the employees in company, everyone learns everywhere. So using YouTube, using Wikipedia, or any social social network, and this education is done at any time. So this is so what we call the lifelong lifelong learning. So. We need the, we need the, a shift in this field, so we need to shift the paradigm. Education is uh, is a central and uh, not only for the educational providers, so for schools and university, but it is very very important also in companies, no, and uh, in general for the whole society. So in the period of COVID, of course, this need is increased. There is there was an urgency to to change in some way. Uh, uh, the way students will learn a specific concept. So there was a, a, a need to remain education and also in companies, you not know, to uh, to shift in some way to change uh, the, the business uh, objectives uh, you need to form and train new employees in a faster, in a faster way. So this is why we need uh, a, a type of incremental uh, innovation that is not uh, static but is very dynamic and adaptive during uh, during the life so what are the, the the vision that we what is the vision that we have in education in the digital society of course we want to develop advanced digital solution to have uh, innovative learning and training uh, we we want to ensure the inclusion of students and employees safety and equity and we want to use the AI, you know, to, to, to do this. So our mission is to exploit uh, AI techniques to perform advanced research and to develop innov innovative digital technology for uh, uh, the, the, the innovative teaching. And we want to deliver personalized and adaptive learning. So, of course, for this, we need to involve uh, Uh, in the uh, design of AI-based solution. And we want to foster the AI and data related skills around the, this ecosystem. So what are the main objectives? Personalized and adaptive, uh, exploiting AI-based systems. We want to ensure the inclusion and the innovation in education with AI. And we want to foster digital skills and AI in, in, in education. So for this, <coughs> sorry, for this we are implementing uh, our platform platform for education that is playful, collaborative, and adaptive. As you can see in this in this slide, we have two parts of uh, of the picture. One on the left side that is the playful education. So it means that we want to inject and use uh, uh, gamification techniques. So we want to use games. Uh, in learning, we want to have inquiry-based learning, but of course we want to push challenges to the students in order to motivate them and to make the attention during the education very high. On the other side, in the right side, we have the aspect of collaboration. So we want to have collaborative learning, we want to have cooperation and collaboration as mecha mechanics, we want to have groups as uh, entity in the learning, uh, we want to have the learning more very flexible so and personalized for the specific needs of the specific learners. And we want to have also uh, the just-in-time teaching. This is called the InnoDita project. So it's an internal project in FDK that, of course, has the objective to realize a platform that cover all these aspects that you see in this, in, in this slide. As I said, we, we want to have playful education. To have a playful education, the traditional teaching is not enough um, because it often lacks uh, the ability to attract and retain the full attention of the learners. And this brings in uh, 
and the decreasing of the interaction, engagements, and the learning outcomes at the end. So this is why we want to uh, use exploit the gamification solution as a component of these learning environments in order to push this uh, motivational aspect and to enhance uh, um, uh, and to foster behavioral changes, engagement, motivation, and participation in, in the learning in the learning activities. So gamification uh, has been used a lot in learning and training. Usually what this kind of system do is they use the gamification elements like uh, points, badges, uh, trophies, uh, awards, uh, challenges, and so on as game elements, okay? And these tools are used as engagement tools. Um, gamification is used to uh, eliminate, in some way, uh, the dropout rates. Uh, for the learner's perspective, they introduce more interaction during the learning activities, and of course, uh, they will bring it to have uh, more impactful learning outcomes uh, uh, at the end of the experience. Of course, they introduce also me mechanics uh, to to have uh, feedback to the students and to have social interactions, and at the end, the more satisfaction both from the teacher perspective than from the uh, learner perspective. So, what are the research questions that we want to answer? Of course, we want to provide the tools for this to manage this playful education, tools that are scalable and that can be used and that will help teachers and also human resources managers to. Uh, train and learn the students. Of course, uh, we want to provide components and architecture that make the education and training uh, adaptive and personalized. We want to measure the impact of this kind of systems and how the gamification can use and can help to, to improve the learning uh, facilities and the learning outcomes uh, for, for the students. And we want to implement the gameful uh, education and training tools able to manage also not only the competition between between players but especially the cooperation um, in, in in the learning in the learning plan so we did some uh, preliminary experiments on this so especially in the in the education in software engineering this is because i i'm teaching the software engineering at the university level and the goal was how we can improve the learning and software engineering in this kind of courses using gamification. We have uh, implemented the two main tools, the puppy game and polyglot that you can see in the slides. And we integrate gamification for the purpose to help students to learn in programming, but also in modeling uh, software, so software languages. So the first tool is puppy game. Puppy Game has the goal to augment the model-based systems engineering tools with self-training facilities. Uh, there is a, a, a strong need to reduce the modeling learning curve in this kind of, uh, of uh, educational domain. And for this, we have implemented Puppy Game, that is a gamified software modeling environment, uh, where we involve different stakeholders. So we involve the gamification experts that help us to design the specific gamification artifacts to use in the specific learning tool. We involve the teacher that need to teach modeling languages and modeling uh, um, concepts and theories, and then user, of course, the students, but also the employees or software developers that use the gamified version of the tool in order to improve the learning of a specific or specific tool. So the tool is composed by six main components. The first uh, component is the game dashboard. So a student can access the tool, can log into the tool to a login facility, and can access it to the available games uh, in the in the in the in the in puppy game. So this means that, as you can see in this slide, the student can access the game devoted to the master in software engineering. That's uh, we can follow a, a certain learning path composed by different levels. And for each level, there is an exercise defined by the teacher in order to learn a specific concept in this specific course. So when the, the player has an access to this a specific level, can use the, the modeling tool to implement the, the exercise. Okay, And um, this exercise is assigned by the teacher 
to the specific level of, of the game. So the player can play with the modeling exercise that can advance the learning path. So each modeling game is defined to target a specific learning objective. In order to do this, we use the GDF that stay for um, gamified design framework is a model driven design framework that we have implemented to specify the, the game in order that the teacher can specify its own level, its own exercise in autonomous, in autonomous way. As soon as the game is ready, we need to implement the gamification rules. And for this, we have a gamification engine that maintain the status of each player and, and uh, notify to the player as soon as the exercise has been done in a correct way or in a wrong way with uh, the, the new gamification, uh, gamification status. We have a game master that is a component that's put together the exercise done by the, the player, the, the, uh, the, the correctness rules defined by the teacher and the gamification rewards that we want to assign to a specific uh, a specific game level and for this we have the, the specific interface to um, give feedback to the students at each level of, of the game and of course the last component is the model comparator that is responsible to assess the correctness of the modeling exercise and give feedback to, to the student at each level of the game or at the end of the exercise when the final result should be uh, notified to the to the user. Of course, we support different type of games. So we have the hangman, where each error is uh, accumulated and uh, um, will uh, bring to the construction of the hangman. We have the on your own, where the the the, the student is free to model the complete uh, assigned exercise and can submit the model at the end of the. Of, of the modeling exercise, and we have a flow that represents the learning path assigned to the student that can have also a form of a specific narrative. For example, in this case, we have the assignment of the green belts or blue belts and so on until the black belts for the specific uh, modeling assignment. We did uh, some initial experiments. so. Of course, we, we received the demo award at the model conference with this, uh, with this tool. We started with uh, experiments with students in different universities, for example, in France, in Germany, UK, Sweden, and Russia. We divided the groups into, into sets. One group that used the tool without the gamification solution, other groups that we use puppy game with the gamification solution in order to compare and to understand the effectiveness of using or not using gamification for teaching, for example, a UML class, uh, class diagrams. The second tool is Polyglot that is uh, uh, as a different angle, as in this case, we want to teach uh, uh, programming languages. This is Polyglot, so we support different programming languages. Uh, we use the Visual Studio Code notebooks for the student side. So with the, these notebooks, the student can learn programming and modeling languages. Each notebook is configured and personalized for the student and is equipped with gamification mechanisms. Uh, at the same time, the teacher can also empower the notebooks with uh, feedback and uh, in order to support the students uh, while they are completing the specific, uh, the specific assignment. Of course, uh, Polyglot has a specific architecture that is uh, from one side, we supported to use a Visual Studio Code notebooks. From the other side, we have the supporting languages that we can increase uh, adding uh, components related to the specific language to learn. And of course, this uh, tool is also embedded in Moodle in the sense that uh, this learning management system can exploit Polyglot as a tool and the teacher can suggest to use Polyglot during uh, during the, the lectures. So of course we support uh, a set of languages, but we are planning to add more languages like JavaScript, HTML, CSS, SQL, and so on. Uh, we also are planning to add more gamification mechanics like group challenges that are the most challenging from our perspective. 
And of course, we want to extend the student front end. We don't want to use only Visual Studio Code, but we want to use other front end tools like Jupyter or other some custom experience that we want to implement for a specific for a specific case. From the teacher perspective, we want to make a way to to specify learning paths that we will see in the next in the next slide. Of course, all these uh, uh, tools are part of uh, what we call motivational digital system. That is the core research direction that we have in our unit. In this unit, we use AI techniques for adaptive gamification. We use also game analytics and player profiling to personalize the experience for the specific uh, for the specific end user. And for this, we have our gamification engine that will support all this uh, dynamicity during the, the experience done by the, uh, the, the students. Of course, uh, uh, these uh, tools are supported by a specific uh, design framework. So we represent our systems with these three layers. So the game elements, the game mechanics, and the game dynamics. The overall goal of the motivational digital systems is to um, provide the tools that uh, help the students uh, to, to cooperate, to compete uh, for the specific game, but in general to create more dynamics like engagement. So how the different students can be in some way motivated during the gamification experience. So we start from the main game elements, the, the main building blocks of a gamified application. We pass uh, through the mechanics that specify a set of rules, sorry, a set of rules that uh, specify how the game should evolve for, for the participants, for example, for the student. And we reach the dynamics that uh, is the emergent behavior that arises using uh, a game full system when a specific mechanics is, uh, is used. For this, we have implemented the domain specific language. So in this uh, slide, you can see uh, the different aspect of the game full system starting from the gamification mode. So the game element, the game mechanics, and the game dynamics. So we have different domain specific language to express the different aspect of, of a gamification system. And of course, we have also game utilities that can be used to simulate the game that we have defined, but also to adapt the game at runtime when we discover that, for example, we have defined the game not in a precise way, or not in a correct way, we can adjust some challenge for the players, some of some game aspects that could be revised during, during the, the game execution. So let's skip this. Uh, this is part of a gamification design model that we are implementing. GameDoc is in some way our requirements document, is how a new uh, a developer can uh, specify a new uh, gamified system. Um, the gamification design mo model is a kind of reference model to specify and implement a new gamified system that is compo composed by different components that you can see uh, in this slide. So we start from the context that characterize the aim of a gamified system. For example, in the education, we want to improve the learning uh, curve of, of the students. We want to maintain the motivation and uh, make uh, the learning uh, long running. This is the context, the domain represent education in this case. The target user are the students and the, and the teachers, and we want to encourage a specific behavior inside of this gamification uh, system. Of course, uh, we need to represent what is the technology that we want to use, for example, a mobile app or a desktop application for the students or the, the Visual Studio Code notebooks for the, for, the, for the students, and we reach the core of the gamification system, like what are the behavior that we want to implement at the level of the game, what are the feedback that we want to give back to the, to the students, and of course, what are the gamification elements that we want to inject in the system that we want to use in order to personalize the experience of, of a player, of a student, and to adapt these the personalization, so the, the game experience during, during the execution. Of course, this is part of a more complex process for gamification community. So as soon as we have 
a gamification document, so the requirement and specification of our system, we want to assign and review this document. As soon as this document in the left part is ready for the implementation, we use our GDF environment framework to generate the code of our gamification system that can be executed by, by the end user. And this is the time where we have a user experience evaluation with the end user, and we can share at the end our gamification document that is validated by the community and by the end user as an open access document then can be in some way read and uh, commented by the overall the overall community of course our main uh, focus uh, in this educational domain is to enrich uh, the personalized learning and training with, uh, with ai okay, ai is the main component we want to personalize the learning we want to personalize the learning not only at the individual level, but especially at the group level. We have cooperation, we want to have cooperation between students. And of course, we want the teacher active in this, uh, in this uh, uh, goal. So we want the teacher active. The teacher should be able to be active in managing this personalized learning. So this is part of an Erasmus Plus project that is called ENCORE. That is the goal to reach the use of a circular of open educational resources for education. We are part of this consortium. And the goal of this project is to contribute to the teaching and recognition of skills relevant for three different macro trends that are digitalization, climate change, and economic recovery challenge after the, the COVID. So we use AI and gamification as techniques. And we want to support the definition of these uh, personalized and adaptive learning path for the learning for the learners. So how it works? So we have a database now active in our in our uh, web page in our project. So this database includes what we call the open educational resources, all the materials that the teacher can use to define what we call the learning path. These open educational resources in the different skills can be used to create a map of concepts related to the specific skill. So we have the concept that the teacher they want to, to teach. Uh, and this concept is related to the set of open educational resources available in the, in the database. When we have this map, uh, the teacher can use an enabler, a tool to define what we call the alert. The, the students using, for example, the Visual Studio Code notebooks uh, personalized for a specific uh, student. So at the end, we want to define also pedagogical guidelines that would be used by the teachers to define this learning path and provide, provide this learning path to the, to, the, to the end user. For this, we are implementing the learning path editor for the teachers. So in these uh, screenshots, you can see how the teacher can define the learning path. The learning path for us is a graph. It's a graph with a set of nodes where each node represents a specific learning activity. For example, I want to teach a statistical course. In this case, I have a lesson specific for uh, teaching the average concept. After the, 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 the concrete lesson, I want to have an exercise for the students that they can do in an in autonomous way. As soon as the exercise is done by the student, the student can pass or fail the, the specific exercise. We can have a review lesson for the average concept, or in the past case, we pass to the median concept. So we have different concepts in the learning path, the same learning path, and the teacher can express this kind of nodes and also how the student can pass from one node to another one during this learning experience. We have also other different type of nodes. So for example, we can have coding exercise in a specific programming language. We have quizzes uh, type of nodes where the, the, the teacher can specify quizzes, okay? And, and other type of nodes that we can include uh, during uh, the definition of this learning path. Of course, uh, this learning path can be defined by the teacher, but at the same time, we can use AI to generate uh, uh, to generate specific uh, learning node. So we can call the AI components. We can in some way revise the content of these, 
uh, learning activity provided by an AI component, the teacher can revise the nodes and we can provide what we call contextualized and personalized learning path using in, um, artificial intelligence uh, techniques. Of course, as soon as the teacher has defined the learning path, we have the other part of the coin. The student can execute the learning path. We use Visual Studio Code notebooks to execute one by one the nodes represented in the graph of the learning path. And we also include feedbacks for the students, like in this, in this example, suggesting a new material to read, for example, or we can give feedback in terms of gamification, so the level reached, the, the medals received, or the, the, the score uh, uh, specific for the specific node of the learning path. Of course, we have all other user interface that we can use. And we did an experience with Alexa. So we can execute some part of this learning path uh, node using Alexa, like the pieces, and we can interact with Alexa and the student can execute pieces using uh, this uh, natural way to interact with, uh, with the voice uh, and user interaction component. All these uh, ex experience and research direction that I have shown in this, uh, in this uh, talk is part of a, of a platform that we are implementing. Uh, this is called Playful Education Digital Platform for Personalizing and Adaptive Learning. Uh, as you can see, we have two main aspects. So we want to have the experience playful, but we want uh, to reach uh, the, the, the ultimate goal of our research, that is improve the learning of a student. For this, we use the profile of the students, of course, the learning path defined by, by the teachers. Of course, uh, we want to gamify the experience and uh, we have techniques to gamify the resources, the open educational resources and activities that the students do. Uh, at the end, we have personalized adaptive digital learning path that can be defined and exploited by, by the, the students. So, of course, this is part of uh, um, artificial intelligence for personalized learning, when from one side we have the opportunities, so we have a lot of uh, uh, knowledge and lot of open educational resources. We have AI techniques and uh, natural language processing tools that can be used to manage these uh, open knowledge. Of course, we, we, we have new pedagogical approaches to define, okay? But of course, we need to, pro to provide the tools uh, for, for the stakeholders. So we need to support uh, teachers uh, to define the, the education, to define this learning path. Uh, we need to create engaging courses. So we need to introduce gamification to create engaging courses. And of course, at the end, we want to certify the students. And for this, we need to have new novel uh, certification processes for new learning, learning uh, paths. So I conclude my presentation with the few research directions that, uh, that we, we have in our plan. Of course, we need to implement domain-specific languages for uh, gamified system design development. We already started with this, with GDF, but of course, we need to improve and extend these languages. We want to support a multi-level modeling in software engineering. We want to continue to work on personalized learning using adaptive and day based techniques. Uh, we, we, need, uh, we strongly need uh, to profile the users and to use machine learning techniques uh, to guide you know, this personalization and to improve in some way the gamification and the motivational part. Uh, we need uh, to implement a recommendation system to support the teacher in selecting uh, the open educational resources to use. Okay? Uh, of course, we can add uh, the gamification part, but also the learning environment using virtual reality and uh, augmented reality together with, with the gamification. And then um, last but not least, uh, we need to include the ethics uh, uh, while we are implementing uh, these, uh, uh, these digital tools, uh, especially when we, we need uh, to uh, teach and learn something to students, ethics. Uh, uh, is an important aspect uh, in this in this uh, context. So, in general, uh, my research is uh, is summarized in this slide. So, we want to have adaptive learning, that is a way to deliver 
personalized learning experience that address an individual unique need. So we want to personalize the learning for students, both from the individual, but also the level of groups, but the ends should be adapted and personalized. So these are the two keywords that are, um, are a strong uh, a part of my, of my research. So all these works are uh, um, part of what I did books, and so uh, especially the domain-specific language in practice that include the part of GDF, so the framework to define uh, using domain-specific language gamified systems. And of course, the last book that is in progress that will be out in the next model that includes uh, how software engineering has been used uh, for games in, in serious content and education is one part of uh, of, of this book. So I like to use some references uh, on my research in this specific field on software engineering for, for game full systems. And uh, uh, I'm here for uh, your questions and uh, thanks a lot for, for your attention. Yeah, great. Yeah, very good talk uh, about uh, the AI best uh, solution for uh, innovative learning and teaching i really like very much i hope uh, all the participants also like that uh, talk and uh, they have taken a lot of quotes out of your talk though i am not uh, from this field but i learned a lot more uh, about how the ai has been involved in um, teaching as especially for uh, teachers and the students and i hope this will go for longer and we will be able to have a gamifying learning and teaching for together yeah, uh, so uh, Antonio, can you stay for uh, uh, a Krishna talk and we will take the questions uh, for both of you uh, at the panel discussion last. Of course, of course. Of course. Yeah, so uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, such a wonderful and nice talk. So now we have a second speaker, a very distinguished speaker again, and uh, she has a very high profile. Again, it will be very difficult for me to read her profile uh, in two minutes, but I'll try to pick up uh, the best which I can do it for uh, you people. So uh, I am a little sorry if I pronounce something wrong because uh, a lot of things are in Spanish. So <laughs> you can understand. Uh, so Dr. Cristina Balcano Sayo Lopez is uh, Maria Jambarno, Senior Distinguished Researcher at the University of La Pruna, UDC, Spain and also a uh, principal investigator of the Fundad project financed by Next Generation EU Framework. She is also a principal investigator of the EU Horizon 2020 research project navigating uh, scheme, uh, historical challenges and uh, potentialities of the EU free movement uh, of uh, persons, 1985 to 2015. From 2019 to 22, she was a Marie Curie Fellow uh, as a Senior Global Fellow at uh, the European Studies Center, EC, ESC, EUG in uh, uh, Monet, European Center of Excellence of the University of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and uh, at the uh, University of Venice as well. She uh, previously was an Assistant Professor in European Culture and Pol Politics uh, at the University of uh, uh, Gironin and the Santander Senior Fellow at Iberian and Education and, and Iberian and European Study at uh, the European Study Center. Uh, she is also uh, belongs to the University of Oxford where she remained as a senior member. Since uh, 2020, uh, 21, Dr. Uh, uh, Blanco uh, is an executive committee member of uh, Global Young Academy, which uh, this year I also got a uh, membership uh, based on uh, German Academy of Science uh, okay, and she is also a full member of and fellow of the Young Academy of Europe (YAE), full member of the Young Academy of the Spain, and the standing delegate of uh, SPA Press Project. She obtained her PhD uh, in history and uh, history and civilization with a specialization in European uh, integration history at the European University Institute (EUI) and received uh, the FAEYES Best Thesis Award by the European Research and Mobility in 2008 for her work on uh, narrative uh, temporalities in uh, history of EU's uh, enlargement process. So with that word, uh, those words, I uh, would like to request uh, Dr. Christina 
uh, to start her talk. Thank you very much uh, for your kind presentation. I hope you can hear me well. And uh, thank yes. you for <laughs> all your kind words. And uh, I, I would like to especially thank all the, all the participants today for being here with us on a Friday to talk about career development and research opportunities and the future perspectives. So thank you very much for being here. And now I would love to share my <laughs> presentation. So let's yeah, see. Please. Yeah, everything works now. So, okay. I perfect. Hope... Yeah, it's very perfect. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yes. Um, and first of all, I would like to say that I. This is like a Friday of joy. I mean, I, I was very happy to see that uh, there would be another speaker coming from the interface between research and technology and more from the side of the hard sciences. And from my experience, as, as you could see from the, the short biography, I'm specialized in the humanities and social sciences. So I would like to offer also that point of view, but also to convey a more general uh, message, because I, I think that um, when I was referring to this Friday of joy and joyful experiences, I think we are very harsh, very hard on ourselves. Um, and many times we we always wait till we uh, uh, obtain some accomplishment or reach some benchmark to be kind to ourselves, to, to offer us um, this kind of joy and we wait till we learn a lesson but joy can be the lesson also in the research world so that i would like to, to start with this optimistic note even if it's a very uh, challenging time and my first idea i mean the, the main idea i would like to convey today is that um, we work a lot on the storytelling from my fields from the humanities from the social sciences and stories are an act of courage and also building a career is part of how you want to write how you want to create a story that is not there you you, you don't see it yet so you have to create it and then you have to dare also to write it down to to carve it to convey it and so this presentation will be about this idea of storytelling uh, your career as an act of courage, a creative act of courage. And that's why I entitled it uh, Future Pathways and Building the Present itself, that would be the main spirit. And I would like to start with an invitation, especially at the end of a week, being a Friday today, with this whole idea of being in the moment. That is sometimes something, many times, I mean, something that we do not allow ourselves to live. We are always projecting ourselves toward multiple, many times conflicting futures, but we forget about all the benefits of being in the moment. And this is something I will touch upon during my presentation as well. The whole idea of the new priority that is finally given to well-being in research and academia. So I think it's the right time to talk about how to relearn self-compassion as a key to move forward in a research career. And I think that this should not be a conversation of searching for and worrying about something, but I consider that we should take some kind of collective time of pausing for a little moment and just breathing and being in the now. And I know this is counterintuitive when you think about building a research career or career development or what to do next, for instance, after your Marie Curie Fellowship. The last thing you think of is to rest, to stop, to replenish. But I mean, this very concept of breathing and being in the now and relearning self-compassion, I think it has helped not just me, but many other researchers I know to focus and gain the energy to move forward. So that's something I, I wanted to share with you today. And also a question that is fundamental. It lies at the foundations of the identity issues related with career development, which is the question, who would you, would you like to become? And not just as a professional, but also as a person. Who would you like to become? And in that sense, you realize that the intention is the identity. It's something parallel. And I brought these two quotations just to share this, some kind of inspiration about the idea of 
identity building through intention, the, the idea of heading towards. Many times researchers were saying, like, oh yeah, you're not there, but you're heading towards something. And we seem to, to live in this perpetual um, heading towardness, even if the word doesn't exist, but we have intention. And this is really our power, the intention building identity. So Anais Neil said, for example, that the earth is heavy and opaque without dreams. And also Mona Masso referred to the idea of productivity, which is, you know, a very useful obsession of building a career research. So productivity means to make intentional choices towards a goal. And sometimes, many times, most of the times, the goal could be just to replenish because productivity could mean also to rest. And this is something we tend to forget. So I wanted to use this presentation as an invitation <laughs> to, to reflect upon that together. And here is just a list of some ports of call during my, my personal itinerary. But uh, it's just about realizing that your dreams are more important than your fears when you're trying to, to build this future you after a big accomplishment or a turning point or a critical juncture in your life and your career. Mm -hmm. And now I would like to take a, a little moment to think also about the context. We are confronted with so many challenges today. We are coming from so many years of a global pandemic. We have uh, conflict and displacement and discrimination and so many challenges coexisting at the same time. So. Um, when we talk about career development and career building in, in researcher, I think it's also important to, to think in terms of not just challenges, but the responses to the challenges and also the central notion of well-being in research that has been neglected for such a long time. And in that sense, I think it's important to encourage a moment of reflection as a new way of confronting what many times we can see is our shared precarity and volatile positions and also to launch an appeal to this well-being agency. It's not just something passive. We need to have this well-being agency and receiving ways to move forward together as a global research community. And that's why I think these kind of dialogues are so important. So we talk about moving forward. But there's also an invitation to move inwards, to travel inwards. And that's why uh, mental health has become such an important issue, finally, as part of the, the conversation about career development in, in research and academia. And in that sense, I think it's very important to shed light also on our own very human vulnerabilities and to see them as a compelling force that is able to bring together also these intimate angles of research and creativity as an added value. And this is something we are not used to see, and that's why I, I really enjoy this idea of addressing many counterintuitive points today. We don't see human vulnerabilities as an added value. But they can be opposed to something we know already too well, which is all these demeaning understandings of metrics and productivity that seem to be at the core of any notion of career development in research. And so in the end, we forget the most important things like talking about fulfilling livelihoods, uh, which should be at the core of all our conversations. And in that sense, well-being in research and academia, Nowadays, I think it's moving to this point of no return, to this kind of event horizon where it's now anymore a matter of negotiation. It's, it's seen finally as a responsibility to learn how to draw these enhancing boundaries, boundaries that are not limiting, but empowering, and stating new forms of balance between socially meaningful projects, but also fulfilling livelihoods, trying to recover ourselves in the picture, not just as passive providers of innovation and productivity and metrics and, and so on. So one of the key invitations of this presentation is the idea of daring to own your own context. I was talking about storytelling as an act of courage at the beginning, and I think it's important that 
you write down, you convey and you share the story of the career you want to build, of the person you want to become by owning the context and not just being under it. And it's something that uh, writers like Victor Flank mentioned many times, this whole notion that if you cannot uh, change situations or contexts, you are always challenged, but also invited to change yourself in a way that develops capacities and potentialities that were not evident before. So there could be a, a new confident capacity in redefining purposes, but also reason of creating, of working and so on. Uh, also a redefinition of um, how we acknowledge our own fragility and how we can use this vulnerability as a motor for mutual empowerment. So I think this could be some contextual and useful food for thought. And now I would like to come back to this fundamental question about what what's next, right? And this question would be, who would you like to become? Because sometimes we leave this question and it's really at the end of all the list of to do things when we move forward in in our life and our careers. So who would you like to become? And this is about writing your own script and creating your own future, building your future, and about not letting anybody override the script you want to enact for your own lifetime. And of course, you will find <laughs> limitations and gatekeeping all around this. But when social constraints appear as too powerful, it's the time to carve your space and make it yours and own your story. And also about learning, evolving, becoming adaptable, transforming yourself and give form to your own unique voice. And in the previous presentation, we're talking about how to uh, communicate and share this, this unique voices by students and, and so on. So I think I agree with that. I think it's important that you give form to your own unique voice and thinks of the ways, of the tools, of the methods and approaches to do it. And it's something you don't have to do alone, it can be a collective endeavor done in dialogue, as we, we hope to be doing <laughs> here today. And also, very importantly, you should remember not to hold yourself back. Sometimes it's, it's really you holding yourself back. And do not let yourself believe others' cliches and prejudices. They are not yours. So the objective would be that of unfolding your potentialities and at the same time being aware of two opposed realities, which are doors and traps when developing this career in research. So I think it's important to take into account, <laughs> say that from experience, that some doors are gateways, gateways of opportunity and development, but other doors, there are traps. And some examples of these traps could be the impossibility to negotiate salaries for women, that women are not accepted for senior positions. And instead, I always propose that we should find not just for women to take women on board, but to have women on boards. And how can we do all these things? So in my experience as well, I would recommend reaching out to mentors, to networks like the Marie Curie Alumni Association, confidential advisors, legal services and experts, health experts, because asking for help is something courageous. I mean, it's nothing to be ashamed of. It's a gift of trust that you offer to your own safety nets. And in that way, you can reach the capacity to implement new knowledge, which is something we always dream of doing, right, when we will work on research. So how can we implement this new knowledge? And I like to use this metaphor of underwater falls, underwater waterfalls, and also to take the lessons of the qualitative. It's something I bring together <laughs> from, my, from my fields of humanities and social sciences. And so I remember this quotation by Susan Langer saying that if we like to have new knowledge, we must get us a whole world of new questions. That's how you move forward. New questions bring this new knowledge. Um, this helps us develop an ability to be present in flux, to live in flow, 
and also a capacity to disregard your own rigidities. Sometimes we are not aware of these rigidities, so it's an introspective work we can we can do as well. And an invitation to look not just for the what, but also for the with whom and for the why a particular project, a particular approach, this why is always linked to identity and at a given time in a given context. In that way, we can focus not just on visibility, but I know we are always reminded of that, but on discoverability and how to project all that you are beyond your work. I'm sure you are familiar with concepts like a curriculum B, like all the things that you can project, all the things you are beyond your own professional work, all the activities you develop, how you express your own creativity. And this brings us to something fundamental, which is your agency, something we should never forget we have. We have our own agency. And in that way, we can work on drafting our own voice, our own unique voice, by consolidating this agency and by working on unfolding our own potentialities. And in that sense, I also really recommend that you educate your own environment. You're an employer. You are not just a cog in a machine, and you shouldn't just wait to be told how you fit somewhere or who you are. I found it very practical, even in very rigid and bureaucratic environments, to teach employers or to teach your own environment how you want to be called, how to explain what you do, how to um, manifest how you fit, which are your contributions, what is your added value? So you can educate them and you should educate them about that, not the other way around. And in that way, you can bend your own realm to the you that wants to thrive. And it's something very much related to our whole context of so many challenges, pandemic, and so many things coming together in the, in the past years that's not focusing on uh, surviving, but on thriving. So bend your realm to thrive and to be this Jew you want to be. And in that sense, you, you can find something that um, I'm very familiar with that because I've, I saw that in many different countries, is the, the so-called post-doctoralization or perpetual generalization of young scientists. And instead of accepting that, that you are in a perpetual early career role and voice forever, uh, you should become the senior expert you design yourself to be and not let other agents tell you the opposite. So just a, a brief note on, on my field of social science and humanities and career development. I just brought this, this websites with some ideas of where to look for opportunities. For instance, I'm sure you're very familiar with Iraxis that collaborates a lot with the Marie Curie Alumni Association. And they have these virtual and in-person network platforms to find these collaborative voices. There's also the Humanities Network, Manually Careers. And there's a new trend that I think is interesting and offers possibilities. There is this grounding concept of national research talent attraction programs. And in that sense, as I was mentioning before, this um, dichotomy between doors that are gateways and doors that are uh, traps, I think is a very good idea, as it was for <laughs> the Marie Curie program, to talk about persons who are part of this grounding national attraction programs to see how they work and the intricacies and, and the, the insider's perspectives. But you can also expand these views by Young academies, I mean, the global, regional, national young academies are always very keen to share and very critical to share views and perspectives and possibilities and tools and methods to move forward. And you also have, of course, the, in different disciplines, you have organizations and associations. And I always try to look for the ones with this baseline of you rise by lifting others. It's not common, but there and now I, I would just like to <laughs> make a, a little shout out to winning scholars by reading this quotation by Jeanette Winterson that says she must find a boat and sail in it. There's never a guarantee of sure we were aware of that, only a conviction that what she wanted could exist if she dared to find it. So just to finish this short presentation, I wanted to um, to mention 
what is a soothing gift of baby steps. You have own so far and sometimes you just see the concrete steps but you should take a look um, in perspective so there's this soothing gift of baby steps and uh, mark twain i think he expressed that very well when he said that continuous improvement is better than delay delay perfection so thank you very much for your attention and i'm very happy to receive your questions thank you uh, great indeed a very a joyful presentation uh, and i really enjoyed that i hope all the participants also enjoyed it so uh, now floor is open to questions if anybody has any questions please uh, unmute yourself and then we can have a uh, discussions we have a <laughs> Yes, please. Uh, go ahead. Christina, please go ahead. OK, OK. So, yes, I, I want to refer to it. I have a question for Antonio because I, I, I found it really fascinating and uh, you know, very promising development. And at the same time, I have a question about uh, reward systems, um, especially because what you try to convey what, when you teach uh, to the students and when you organize your different courses is that knowledge in itself is a reward. I mean, there's no medal, no prize. New knowledge is a reward. So that's my first question, like how to, I mean, I don't know if ethically, conceptually, how do you reconcile this idea that gaining new knowledge is a reward in itself, so we don't need to give more rewards with this reward system inscribed in this new technology. And my second question has to do with this idea of uniqueness, I mean, the, the unique way of learning. So I think that's the first part of the achievement. You have all these different students realizing that they are learning things that are unique for them. But uh, how can they convey that? I mean, are there tools to express and project the, the realizations, the results of this new knowledge? So how to reach the second step? Thank you so much. So, thanks a lot for, uh, for these two questions are very, very important. Uh, so the first one about the rewarding system, of course, in this case, uh, we have no physical reward. So we, of course, we have no coins, uh, uh, real coins or uh, real uh, uh, gadgets and so on. Uh, of course, here they are virtual uh, uh, rewards because uh, in gamification you can uh, push two different types of uh, so more than two different uh, types of uh, dynamics you know for example if you want to uh, stress more the cooperation between students okay with the concept of uh, uh, coins virtual coins that you can assign to any task of a specific type that you do in cooperation you receive a reward that is a virtual coin that of course you can reuse in your learning path. For uh, more hints, suggestions, or more materials, you know, that you want to unlock uh, while you are experiencing the learning, you know. So in this case, the rewarding is used, okay, to in some way provide a new way to learn, uh, but also to engage and push behaviors that the teacher want to push okay and you can play with these uh, core game elements and rewards uh, uh, to motivate them in this direction okay so of course uh, in other application like mobility smart mobility sustainable mobility of course where the citizen is involved uh, is there that we can have also monetary rewards you know for example uh, we have an experience uh, with the bike uh, bike to work uh, application where we release a new uh, uh, an extra uh, part of the salary you know at the end of the month if you use bikes to reach your working place you know and um, their real rewards are more uh, uh, impactful with respect to, to virtual rewards okay this is for the first question for the second the uniqueness in some ways is an important aspect because uh, while the students are also playing in collaboration but the knowledge is personal as you said in your uh, in your uh, in your presentation you know so the fact that uh, 
you are uh, creating your learning paths uh, and you want to reach uh, some uh, learning objective okay personal learning objective is your personal uh, portfolio no at the end and also the certification that we want to release at the end uh, is not a group certification but is uh, the certification that you can put in your cv at the end of the, your experience okay and the uniqueness uh, it could be done using uh, accumulating the information about uh, your personal experience in learning and the uh, recommendation system or gamification system can in some way be exploited to suggest uh, what to do next okay so for example uh, we have this idea in mind that the teacher can suggest uh, what are the the abstract learning objective now for example uh, i want that the students will learn this concept okay but how this concept is achieved or is it learned by the learner is something uh, personalized while executing the learning path okay so for example uh, i'm a student that i prefer to to do exercises than reading uh, reading books or reading pdf uh, uh, suggested by the teacher no and i am my way to learn okay there are other students that prefer to to read a lot of books and at the end to do some quizzes or some specific uh, exercise is a completely different experience and uh, and we want the tool able to manage this personalization uh, that consider the past experience the preferences of the of the single uh, student but also the preferences and the let me say the constraints that defined by the teacher because the teacher is part of uh, of the picture no we cannot do nothing without the teacher uh, and uh, this is how I see the uniqueness and the personalization aspect in this framework. Great, okay. Yeah, Christina, you have a follow-up thing or can I go to other uh, participants, okay? Prakash wants to have something. Prakash, you will ask or should I read your question? You can unmute yourself, you can ask the question. Okay. Uh, so uh, the Prakash, uh, okay. So Prakash wants to know uh, that uh, thanks uh, for nice presentation, Antonio. Reading, learning, and analytical skill uh, differ individually among the students. Similarly, gaming skills can uh, differ individually. So how you make sure that uh, gaming skill uh, difference doesn't influence the learning outcomes and evaluation? Yes, that is a very important question also this. Um, so in this uh, approach in meta search, my goal is to find the right balance between two main aspects. One is the, the learning outcomes and the second is the motivation. Okay, so if you put these two parameters in a two dimension chart, okay, the goal of the teacher is to reach the upper uh, right uh, zone of this chart. Okay, because we want to increase the learning objective, but we want also to increase the motivation. Okay, so and to write the bite balance is a challenge, is a research challenge. Um, but also in this case, there is a lot of literature review in, uh, in how to profile the users uh, in gamification. So, for example, uh, what are the game elements or the game action that the player prefer? Okay. And we can use this experience and this profiling of the user to, to guide also the gamification part uh, be personalized, okay? So the game can be at the same time as the learning part, can be a part with the specific gamification element, elements and mechanics that you can use, and can be personalized using the eye uh, upon to the experience done by the, by the, uh, the learner. Okay, so I see these two aspects very well uh, uh, connected, uh, and uh, we can not consider uh, their uh, in uh, in an isolation. Okay. Great. Okay, so I think uh, somebody is typing. Uh, till then, uh, I'll ask one uh, very uh, basic things which I am coming in my mind uh, to Christina. See, uh, Christina, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. <laughs> I was just muted, not to interrupt. Yeah, I can hear you well. 
Okay. okay. So actually, uh, see, I come across a lot of uh, students who are brilliant. Okay. They have a very good knowledge, but they cannot express themselves once they go in the podium or they face a crowd. So what you suggest to them, how they can express themselves so that they can build their future in, a, in a, the way which they have, a, you know, the, you know, intelligent. Yeah. So uh, can I ask you a question? Uh, which are they coming from a specific area or discipline or do you see that across different areas? across different areas because I go and give a lot of talks and, and then they come to me and they, generally this question is everywhere I, I came to have it. Okay. They have okay. a curiosity but they cannot express themselves given the chance yeah. is given to them. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for this question. I think of course it's a very challenging question but uh, I, I think there's um, something I, I was I can elaborate on and I was mentioning at the beginning of my, my presentation that uh, there's a tendency to, to try to fit uh, a context. So the, um, the idea that uh, they, they try to, uh, um, to comply and uh, because of course they, they see many uh, discriminatory tendencies or many gatekeeping actions and trying, so they try to conform, they try to uh, comply, they try to fit in a given context. And in that way, they forget who they are. I mean, they forget something we're mentioning right now with Antonio, their uniqueness. And that's why also uh, linked to my, to my question to him, like once, uh, first, the first step for all those persons and the first step for the students Antonio was mentioning in his presentation is uh, to realize what makes you unique, what, uh, what creates your unique voice, what makes you distinctive. And I would say that I, I, there's something very important I want to say about this. I mean, distinctive is, has always been linked to a competition. To, I, I want to be unique and I want to be distinctive because I will get this and you won't. So <laughs> it's linked to, to, to competition. But uh, there's something I, I, I tend to call inclusive growth. So you can grow and you can develop and you can unfold your capabilities and you can have a, an amazing career by being inclusive, by having this inclusive growth, by being unique, by also by sharing this uniqueness in a way that you can get farther away by collaborating with others. So my first uh, suggestion to these persons you encounter in so many fora would be that they try to find this unique voice, this distinctive voice, what makes them unique in a very inclusive, shareable way, collaborative way, but also I mean, that's the most difficult second step is how to convey messages. And that's why I was talking about storytelling during my presentation. I mean, there are clear steps they can always follow. And uh, in order to transmit, to express themselves, first of all, uh, they, they should be able to see what I mean, there's something they are not seeing and they can provide. I mean, there's a story that is not written and they can write them. So first of all, when you do that, when you write a story, you have an outline. So you provide this outline. And then after having this outline of your main outcomes, your main concepts, your main ideas, um, you move forward to um, finding what creates a tension. How can you resolve this tension? And sometimes it's about finding a gap and how to bridge a gap. Other times there is a dichotomy and you're trying to find a synthesis between the thesis and the antithesis. So first of all is the outline. Then it would be to, uh, a form of seeing the tension, the conflict and how to solve it. And I think that you can express this uniqueness uh, at the end of this story by trying to provide a, a call for action. You know there's something that can be done about some issue or something that has not been addressed and a gap that has not been breached. So you call to action and in this way you are inclusive. And you, that's why I'm asking also about the interdisciplinarity perspective because um, sometimes you are stuck because you have a, a natural um, connection that you still don't know with other perspectives and other disciplines. I don't know, you can be working in computing and knowing a biologist and understand that your knowledge of ecosystems and organic developments really grows by collaborating with this person. So this call for action after the outline and defining the tension and looking for the solution can create this bridge towards interdisciplinarity and ways of responding 
to these missing parts in ourselves that we are not aware of that can be complemented by others. And that's why I was so happy <laughs> to have today, you know, someone from the humanities like me talking to Antonio, who comes from this interface uh, between technology and research. And I think that like today, many times we discover we're more complementary than we think. So I would suggest this way, very basic way of proceeding with storytelling. And I'm happy, to, I don't know, if you know somebody who wants to know more about that, to, you can give them my contact and I can provide the methodology for that. But it would be a suggestion. And I think the last step is always not to be afraid of multidisciplinarity, but open to this kind of inclusive growth instead of competition. Thank you. Great. Okay. Uh, very good. So I have now answer to tell. Uh, so Krishna, I request you to move your camera a little because we can see your right hand only. Yeah. No, no. This and the other way. Other way. A little Here? more. A little yeah. more. Yeah. Ah, now we can see you because we were seeing your right hand movement only. <laughs> so it's fine. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so one uh, again uh, appraisal for you from uh, Krishna. Is she start with the K, you start with the C. She is saying that, uh, Krishna, thank you for uh, reminding us about uh, compassion and for ourselves. I could uh, relate uh, it uh, since uh, I'm at maternity leave. That is now followed with the long unplanned sick leave. So she is relating with your uh, presentation and uh, she is praising you for that. And of course, uh, a follow up question for. Uh, 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 again, for uh, Antonio, that uh, Antonio, have you developed uh, courses with the gamification element outside of uh, code learning? Like example of hydro for um, this hydraulic engineering, civil engineering, or do you know for such examples? So um, the uh, the platform that we are implementing is uh, open to any uh, topics. Okay. Uh, so, especially in the project, as uh, I was uh, explaining in the presentation, we have this uh, database of resources that is uh, uh, in, deep, in, three, in three different uh, set of skills, digital, uh, entrepreneurial skills, uh, and uh, uh, green skills. Okay. So, for example, in digital, it includes a lot of, a lot of skills. And... Um, uh, so the the editor for the for the teachers is open to any any domain. So it depends on uh, the educational material that is available. Because uh, with this editor, uh, of course, if you are interested, we can have uh, a, a demo a demo session uh, on especially on this on this editor. But in general, you can uh, create a new node in this in this part. And this new node is uh, material, so you can upload uh, uh, PDF slides, videos, uh, uh, as you prefer. You can also create quizzes on a specific topic. You can exercise on a specific topic. So it's very, very uh, general purpose uh, editor. So great. So I have asked uh, all the participants uh, if they have any questions. Um, so thank you from uh, Christina to you both. Uh, so uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, I think then um, please unmute yourself. You are uh, having a right uh, to unmute. If not, please let me know. You can raise your hand and then uh, ask the questions. So till then, uh, okay, I'll ask uh, Antino because I have a lot of curiosity about AI-based uh, teaching and uh, learning. So uh, how you see uh, the future, okay? Uh, how long it will take to implement? So a, a good question. Uh, in my opinion, uh, now is, uh, is the period where uh, uh, GPT and AI is growing and uh, a lot of people is uh, talking about uh, uh, using AI in any discipline, okay. Um, since I am, a, in some way, my background is in software, uh, computer science in general, okay. Uh, and I, I uh, learned uh, during my master degree now, uh, some years ago, okay, um, how to program uh, using uh, any 
uh, uh, help. Okay, so we uh, we didn't use uh, Stack Overflow. We didn't use AI. So we use only books uh, and the slides from our teachers. Okay, and at uh, that time it was very very difficult uh, to to program uh, to debug uh, the code and to make the product very uh, useful and uh, uh, working in a correct way. You know, when Stack Overflow was uh, introduced. Uh, for some teachers was a mess. So how the, uh, the student can learn with automatic uh, feedback from the network, from internet. But in any case, this tool was used in a good way and was a tool used to learn at the same time. No? So it was a support for the teacher. And also now AI could be a support, should be a support for the teacher. But the problem is that AI should be contextualized. So we cannot use AI as it is, without to contextualize the learning. So the teacher can use AI support, can ask AI to create educational material, but at the end, also the experience from the teacher's perspective, as Cristina was saying, should be unique, also for the teacher perspective. And the personalization, the personalization of the learning experience must be done in a personalized way. So we cannot ask, the autonomous agent to generate everything, okay, and to pass this uh, to the to the to the learner because otherwise uh, the emotional part and also the um, the social part is not there, okay. So the teacher should be a reference point for the learner. We can use uh, uh, autonomous agent. We can use AI, but in a personalized and you can contextualized way. Yes, okay. Yes, sir. Christina? Yeah, I wanted to, to engage in this conversation because I think, you know, it's no, <laughs> in many senses the way to the future. And I, I want to respond also from, from my own experience, you know, about AI automatization and, and all these um, uses of artificial intelligence for research, for education, for innovation, and so on. So, I, I, I mean, I think we have good news <laughs> because. Uh, thanks to the soft skills that humans have, we will never be redundant in, in that sense. And uh, I think that uh, if something makes us unique, uh, and is uh, especially something developed by, by research of any possible discipline, is critical analysis and also the capacity to give a context. So as Antonio was saying, I mean, this capacity <laughs> will be key. And um, we can start assuming that this might be one of our core tasks for the future as researchers, that we are able to provide a critical analysis. And um, among you know, the many sources, the, the multiplicity of, of data and materials and so on, you have to make a key decision, which is what, what do you select? And which are your criteria for selecting that? So only experts, only persons who have knowledge, and I, there's something I really love, which is the concept of combinatorial knowledge. And I think we are we are converging into that here today. This is like a meta analysis of our conversation. Um, we don't explore it enough. That's what I was mentioning interdisciplinarity before. We don't have that many experiences of combinatorial knowledge, but our combinatorial knowledge and our expertise will be fundamental to guide uh, students and young researchers, and but also policymakers or journalists or civil society organizations in the sense of what do you select and why, and according to which criteria, according to which principles that we agree upon, we decided to agree upon, which principles, which norms, um, and also which discourses. So, we have these principles, norms, and discourses, and, and of course, uh, it's only us, researchers and experts in the future, who will be able to detect a bias. I mean, all this <laughs> bias is key to, to, to uh, still take the reins for all the changes to come with artificial intelligence. And you can study all that, all this kind of manipulation and bias, um, through critical analysis, through discourse analysis, for instance, um, through language, but also through your knowledge and through this combinatorial kind of knowledge. So it was just a way of saying we are not redundant, it's the very opposite. We take the reins and we should 
understand these changes also as an opportunity for empowerment for all the research sector. So it's again an invitation and it's a Friday of joy in that sense. Thank you. So great, I think uh, we do not have any questions now, but uh, uh, it's indeed a great uh, pleasure and privilege for me to chair uh, the session. And of course, uh, we had a very two distinguished speaker today and which uh, both have given a very nice talk. You can see the appreciation coming in the chat box as well. And uh, the both talked over different, but related to the future. One uh, is for the future, other is start with the future, okay? So this is how we can relate, okay? And I hope uh, this uh, series, we will continue in our career development working group as well. And uh, maybe from next month, we will be starting a very uh, normal talks uh, so that uh, we can relate our chapter, uh, our working group as well. So thank you very much. Uh, Christina and uh, Anthony, of course, you are uh, the main person for today. And I really appreciate uh, for your cooperation and support to make uh, this day possible. And really thank you from uh, not only from a career development uh, working group,